You are listening to Live from Lord North Street. I'm Kate Andrews, News Editor at the IEA. Today I'm joined by Dr. Steve Davies, Head of Education at the IEA, to discuss one of the most hot-button issues in American politics, the right to bear arms. Over the course of the next half hour, Steve gives us a history lesson on the Second Amendment, where it came from, and why both sides of the debate get it wrong. Steve argues that the right to bear arms came from a philosophy of classical republicanism, or civic humanism, which means that in a self-governing republic, all citizens have certain obligations and duties upon them, one of which is to use force against outsiders or a tyrannical state. In this sense, gun ownership is an individual right, but not a private right, making gun advocates and gun control advocates wrong in their approach to the issue. Steve discusses the Swiss-style system, which is one of the best examples of an armed militia, and how its laws differ from the United States. We also discuss what makes homicide rates and mass shootings more or less likely, with Steve arguing it has less to do with weapon proliferation and more to do with societal norms and culture. Finally, I asked Steve the million pound question, does the UK need a second amendment? If you like what you hear, subscribe to our iTunes channel. IEA Conversations. Steve, thanks for coming back and joining me on Live from Lord North Street. Uh, I'm really excited about today's podcast because we're going to talk about a topic that is extremely controversial here in the UK for sure, but also in America where I think this uh, where this topic really is going to lead us. And it involves gun rights, particularly okay. the Second Amendment in the United States, which gives citizens the right to bear arms. That is always being debated about how that should actually be defined. It's a very emotive topic. Uh, I think here in the UK, the general opinion is that Americans are nuts when it comes to their guns. They do not understand why people are so adamant about defending the Second Amendment. They see guns as a societal bad. They just see them as fundamentally dangerous. Um, I'm excited to speak to you because not only do you have quite a unique opinion that I haven't heard about the guns issue before, but it's also a relatively thoughtful one. And I think we we lose perspective of thoughtful debate on this topic a lot. So um, my first question to you you is how do you define the Second Amendment and how do you think that the modern debate, especially in the states between, say, the National Rifle Association, which is very pro-Second Amendment, and those who are very anti, how are they getting the debate wrong? Well, uh, I think that the two sides that you mentioned in the current debate in the United States, the gun control advocates on the one hand, the National Rifle Association on the other, uh, have basically got it completely wrong as far as their understanding of the Second Amendment is concerned. The reason for that is that they're looking at it, and I think most people who talk about this issue are looking at it from the wrong ideological perspective. It tends to be seen now as a debate between American liberalism and American conservatism, or to put it in European terms, between what you might call broadly social democracy and classical liberalism or conservatism. Now, in fact, the Second Amendment to the US Constitution uh, grew out of a debate that has almost been forgotten, and it derives from a completely different ideology, which is still known to political scientists, but which has got no public purchase now. Now, the debate and argument that it grew out of was one that had begun in England in the 1690s, but continued throughout the 18th century in the American colonies, and subsequently in the early years of the Republic. And it was over whether or not a permanent army, a standing army, as it was called, was compatible with a free uh, self-governing republic, a free government. And the long-standing tradition on both sides of the Atlantic was to argue that a standing army was an instrument of tyranny and absolutism and that a free government had to have uh, an armed citizenry, a militia. And this was tied to the ideology of what is called classical republicanism or civic humanism, uh, which is the belief that In a self-governing republic, all citizens have certain obligations and duties upon them, the main one of which is to use uh, force to defend the public sphere, the state, against violent threats, both external and internal. So there's a kind of public responsibility for you uh, to defend the state. So that's the actual debate. Now, what that means is that... The Second Amendment does defend and does uphold an individual right. So the American left are wrong on on that, and I'll explain more in a moment perhaps about exactly how they're wrong. 
So it is an individual right. But on the other hand, the NRA and its supporters are also wrong in arguing that what it defends is a private right, a right held by private individuals. That is also wrong. It's a right held by people in their capacity as citizens. So it's an individual right, but it's a public right, not a personal and private right. And it's a right which is attached to and only justifiable if it's attached to a public duty, which is the duty to bear arms in when called upon in defence of the Republic against uh, enemies either internal and domestic or foreign. Uh, so it's associated with the idea of the armed citizenry as the ultimate bulwark of uh, political order and authority and defence against both overarching government and uh, rebellion and foreign threats, uh, which something which is something in this philosophy that all citizens have an obligation and a duty to do. It's a bit like jury service, which is another Republican idea, where you have no choice in the matter. You don't choose whether or not to serve on a jury. It's something which you have to do when called upon by virtue of the fact that you are a citizen of a self-governing community where trial by jury is one of the key rights. So that's the actual context to this. And I think both sides are getting it wrong because they, because they aren't aware of the historical and ideological background ground of this amendment. They don't understand the nature of the right that is being defended. Uh, it is an individual right, but it's a public right, not a private one. This is already fascinating, Steve, and I've never heard the Second Amendment compared to jury duty. So I think we're, I, I knew this was going to be a good one. Um, can we break down the terms a little bit yeah. and get some definitions before we kind of get into the, the, the meat of the intellectual argument? What is the difference between an armed citizenry or a militia and a draft? Well, uh, maybe not that much, actually. Uh, the draft, of course, had a kind of lottery aspect to yes. it, the way it was organized in the United States, which is not the way a militia goes. The idea of a militia is that in a free society, all adult males who are citizens and who are of sound uh, physical condition, i.e. physically capable, uh, should be trained in the use of weapons and should, if called upon, rally to the defence of public order. Now, that may be to defend against uh, riot or uh, insurrection. It may be to defend against foreign incursion, or it may be to defend the traditional liberties of the community against an oppressive government or ruler. It could be any one of those three things. But the point about a militia is that <clears throat> it is the actual organized body of the citizenry as a whole so that every single person in the public body should be trained in the use of arms and should have arms in their possession which enable them to to meet that public duty that's not the same thing as a conscription uh, of the kind that we're familiar with where the state picks out individual people or makes people go off and serve in an army which the state controls. Uh, so a standing army, particularly a professional army, it has to be said, uh, but even a standing army based upon conscription, in this way of thinking, is a terrible threat to liberty because it puts control of deadly force in the hands not of the citizenry as a whole, but in the hands of the government, the people with power within the state. Yeah, the the few, the elite, yes. and that was the other thing I wanted to clarify. But I I, I think I think you have done so. Uh, you are standing to defend the republic, to yeah. defend the concept of the state, not to defend a specific government. Indeed, you could be fighting against the government. Indeed, in absolutely. Yes. yes. If, if it is part of the whole theory of republicanism is that if the people entrusted with power violate that trust and break the implicit or explicit social contract, then in fact, your duty as a citizen of the Republic is to actually resist them and, if necessary, overthrow them. So to really get into this and, and, and to challenge it from a more practical perspective, um, in 2018, if, if citizens had the public right to bear arms and had access to weaponry and needed to stand up against the government. Um, we won't use President Donald Trump as an example, but, you know, um, an, an, another figure out there that they had to stand up and fight. Um, a lot of people, especially on the American left, the gun control advocates argue that this is just a ridiculous notion that with the weaponry that the government has access to, with tanks, goodness forbid, if they were to use something like chemical weapons, there's no way that people with their muskets or their guns or their handguns or their rifles uh, could take on the United States government? Well, as a practical statement of fact, that is actually correct. Uh, but the way a civic Republican from the 18th century responds to that is to say, 
well, look here, this is the kind of mess you get yourself into if you allow the government to have a standing permanent military establishment. It's important to realise that what you're talking about here is not a situation where people, as a purely private matter, own guns um, and just keep them in the house, and it's a purely private or personal matter, because that makes it a private right, not a public right. What is implied here is a completely different kind of military system. So what the Second Amendment is intended to do is to protect the necessary basis for a completely different sort of military. Uh, Essentially, what will we be talking about here? Well, contrary to what a lot of people on the American uh, left say, it doesn't mean something like the National Guard. There are two reasons why the National Guard does not satisfy the terms of the Second Amendment. The first is that it's a volunteer force. And the whole point about the Second Amendment is that uh, in Republican thinking, all adult citizens have this duty. It's not something you can opt in or out of. So it's meant to be a universal right and responsibility to bear arms and use them if necessary. And secondly, contrary to what many people think, the key word in that amendment is not bear, but keep. Because the crucial point is that the weapons in question, the arms in question, should be in the personal possession and keeping of the people who bear and use them, not kept in an arsenal under the control of the central power or the government. Uh, that the people who drew up that amendment believed, correctly I would say, uh, would vitiate the whole idea and principle uh, of a Republican militia. So what it implies actually is a military system rather like the Swiss one, where everybody has to do military service, everybody has to do a certain amount of military training, uh, typically when they're 18, or sometime between 18 and 21, and then for the rest of their life until they reach the age of 50, they have to keep uh, infantrymen's kit and equipment, including uh, the necessary weapons, in their house, in a locked box, uh, but accessible so that they can, if the balloon goes up and they get the call, immediately take it and go and rally at the prescribed uh, meeting point. That's the kind of military system that this whole uh, amendment implies. Now, in that context, the entire adult male population of the United States, presumably with exclusion such as convicted felons, because that was one of the things that was allowed in this way of thinking, uh, would be like Swiss uh, adults today. And you would not have the enormous large military establishment with tanks and all the rest of it that the United States currently has. Another point about this is that this whole way of thinking about what the Second Amendment implies is that you have a military which is purely defensive and which cannot and should not be asked to serve outside the territorial bounds of the United States. That's crucial. And that is also how it's different to the draft, I suppose. Precisely, that, yes. Yeah, you're you you cannot be overseas. asked to go and serve uh, outside the bounds of your country uh, except in very exceptional, very limited circumstances. But you're literally being asked to defend your backyard. And if everybody defends their backyard, yeah, then you have a militia uh, that is protecting yeah. the republic. Switzerland's always the famous example that's used as the counterbalance to the United States. You don't see the mass shootings. You don't see yeah. the same homicide rates. It's an extremely peaceful country as far as comparisons go. And what you're saying is that the U.S., if it were truly upholding the Second Amendment in the way that it was written and in the way that it was supposed to be acted out, could actually look a lot. Like Switzerland. Yes, exactly. That's the kind of military system it ought to have if the people who drew up that amendment, um, you know, had had their way. And it's worth saying, by the way, that it's not just you. You, do, you don't have any choice about what kind of gun you have, because in that sense. Um, the kind of weapons that you will have, that is subject to reasonable regulation by the legislature. So the legislature will determine that you have to have a certain kind of weapon to discharge your duty uh, to defend the state. Now, you may be allowed to have other uh, weapons in addition to that for your private use, uh, but the crucial public responsibility, which is defended by the amendment, that would be, well, because obviously you can't have a militia where one guy's got one kind of weapon and another's got another one, and the the ammunition as such doesn't need mm -hmm. to change. It's got to be uniform and standardised, as it is in Switzerland. And that was well understood at the time. That was what was commonly expected when the people were talking about this in the 1780s and 1790s. So a lot of people who advocate for private gun rights, those who might be members of the NRA, mm. although many who do aren't, uh, would might like this argument because it sounds like what you're saying is that the proliferation of weapons actually makes countries and communities safer. And you often hear that argument from the NRA that in order to stop a bad guy with a gun, you have to have a good guy with a gun. 
Not necessarily. That is possibly true. I mean, what I'm saying is that the the Republican argument that underlies the Second Amendment calls for um, a kind of fairly uniform and standardized set of equipment which all adult citizens would have, which is the Swiss model. Now, in addition to that, you might have personal and private ownership. Now, um, the extent to which that makes society safer is actually not so much a function of the level of uh, weapons ownership. It's to do with a number of other things because this is one of the. This is, of course, an argument against the argument that it is purely the possession of firearms, which leads to lots of things like shootings or high levels of gun-related homicide. Some societies have very high levels of firearms ownerships, but very low levels of interpersonal violence. You mentioned Switzerland, but you can also point to New Zealand, to Canada, to Finland, uh, as amongst many other examples. On the other hand, there are societies like the United States, but also quite a few Latin American countries where you have high levels of firearms ownership and high levels of violent crime. In other words, the crucial variable uh, is a whole set of social factors to do with attitudes, cultural norms and the like. Uh, And it's they that make society safe or unsafe relatively, regardless of whether or not firearms ownership is is widespread in that society. Now, what what, what does follow from what I'm saying, though, is that Congress does have the power, uh, a legitimate power under the terms of the Constitution, to regulate uh, the kind of guns that people can uh, own uh, and how they can use them and and store them. That's perfectly within their, their power. So the kind of claim that they don't have a power to do that is wrong. The problem is that uh, because the original language and ideology within which this uh, amendment was constructed has been forgotten. What you now have is a debate between one side who ultimately, I think, would like to basically stop anyone apart from agents of the government, such as police officers or members of the armed forces from having firearms. Uh, And on the other side, a group of people who are desperate to avoid that at almost any cost, and who therefore are going to resist any kind of proposal for regulation because they fear, often with uh, good reason, that this is going to be the thin end of a wedge or the start of a slippery slope, which will end up with the complete removal of gun ownership rights. Uh, And that is what has actually made this debate so poisonous and toxic. And I think actually you might get on better if both sides uh, revisited and rediscovered the original thinking behind it, uh, which is uh, something that bears no relation, I think, to the current ideological divisions, because classical republicanism, still known in the academy, but it's not an ideology that many people now know about or even espouse, even though it was the foundational ideology of the United States in the up until about, I would say, the 1820s. I think you're completely right about the unwillingness of both sides to look at any kind of center ground. Uh, I'm I'm from Connecticut, and after the Sandy Hook shooting in 2012, which was absolutely horrific, um, which took place at an elementary school, the state of Connecticut brought in new gun laws, and you saw a huge spike in people just going out and buying firearms. And it was because on the one side you thought, well, this is going to lead to the banning of guns, and then on the other side people thought, well, then, you know, I got to get mine now. And that that leads to the worst kind of of decision making. Nobody should be purchasing a weapon yeah. in because of that kind of fear. Exactly. And the the point is, that is actually the kind of regulation that I think is within the legitimate Mm -hmm. authority of the legislature. The the problem is that it arouses these fears, which then leads to this response, which actually defeats the objects of the proposers of those kind of regulations, Mm -hmm. even perhaps their ulterior motive, if they do have one. And if this was done in the context of a kind of military system of the kind I describe, where every adult... Uh, American, uh, it would be both men and women these days, I guess, receives military training, knows how to use firearms, how to look after them, how to Mm -hmm. care for them, and has received military training, and where the the use of firearms is located very strictly within that particular political duty, uh, then I think you would have a different, completely different context to the whole argument about uh, how then you go about regulating this industry and its products. There's an interesting article from the Washington Post last year, uh, which really speaks to the concept of a militia, and it argued that if you were to actually look at mass shootings over the course of the 20th century, an overwhelming majority occurred outside of the United States, and this is because they occurred in countries that had dictatorships and fascist rulers. They occurred in Germany, they were occurring in Poland, and I thought that was an interesting argument because we, the way we think of mass shootings now, of course, is um, naturally related to a lone wolf going and, and attacking a bunch of innocent people. But historically, it's been the state who figures out how to take weapons away from people and then is able to take part in mass shootings itself. So to your point, 
this idea that the state just knowing that people have some way of defending themselves perhaps defers some of the aggression that you could see coming from the top well, way. Well, indeed. I mean, one of, one of the major problems in many parts of the world uh, it is precisely the fact that you have uh, armed agents of the state, not so much the military, it's more a problem typically with the police or paramilitary police forces who have access to deadly force uh, and who are effectively in many cases free from any kind of legal check on their misuse of that that power. And that's a really bad situation to be in because, unfortunately, any kind of occupation which gives people that kind of power is going to attract, uh, regardless of how careful you are to avoid it, the wrong kind of people, I'm afraid. So you're going to have a certain number of people in that role with that kind of power who are the last kind of people on earth that you want to be given that power to. And this is always going to lead, I think, to bad results, as we can see. It's worth saying about mass shootings, by the way, that the kind of mass shooting you're talking about where um, individuals or no more than one or two people go and uh, shoot up uh, innocent bystanders on a mass scale, that's actually a comparatively recent phenomenon. Shootings of that kind are almost unknown before the 1970s. And my personal suspicion is that there's actually a very specific reason as to why they've become so common since then. Uh, Partly, I think it's to do with the contemporary mass media and social media and the desire for fame. But I think it's also very closely related to the use of very powerful psychotropic drugs to control depression uh, and other psychological disorders. Uh, In pretty much every single case where there's a mass shooting of this kind, whether in the United States or elsewhere, as in Australia, for example, uh, or Finland recently, uh, you discover that the person, the perpetrator responsible has been on or relatively recently has just come off these kind of powerful psychotropic medications. Uh, And I think that that combined with the sort of media world that we've created and built up for the last 30 years is what has led to this phenomenon appearing when it was actually extremely rare uh, or almost un- non-existent uh, before the 1970s. Uh, that's, of course, as you say, quite different from the kind of mass shootings which are familiar where people usually, uh, agents of the state, you know, shoot down lots and lots of innocent bystanders. It's always frustrated me in the States that the go-to when there is some kind of terrible shooting and tragedy is is to go directly after the weapon that they used, or very often the weapon that they didn't use. Uh, they, they go after what they call semi-automatic weapons or automatic weapons um, with very little understanding about what these weapons actually do or look like, um, and also very often they weren't used by the shooter, there's very little talk of mental health. It's there on the surface, but no one ever does anything about it. Um, and, and, and to your point, you know, Congress does have the power, and that is the debate about how highly these weapons should be regulated. But I do mm. think mental health often goes badly overlooked. Well, uh, certainly. The point is, if you had a system where the primary route of access for adults to guns was through a form of structured military, you know, militia training, uh, you might very well identify at a much earlier stage, much more clearly, the kind of people who clearly have mental health problems, uh, Mm -hmm. who you do not want to do it. And it seems perfectly appropriate for me that, you know, regardless of what system you have, that the legislature should take action to say that although there's a default citizen's right to do this, there are certain people who are excluded from that right. Mm-hmm. Felons are one obvious example, particularly people convicted of a, a, a violent crime or the one involving the use of firearms, or people who are mentally unstable. The problem is that um, it is A, spotting people like that, but also the problem is I think we have at the moment got a kind of therapeutic approach to a number of mental health issues which... Um, actually can in some cases make those problems worse rather than better Uh, and that's a whole different issue I think but it's something that really ought to be thought about in the context of tragedies like this but it isn't too much. So Steve here's the million pound question does the United Kingdom need a second amendment? Well uh, Actually, the debate that I mentioned began in the United Kingdom in 1695. Uh, We'd had a permanent army for a number of years before then, and everyone knew that the peace was going to be made with France that year. Uh, And then there was a huge argument about whether or not we should disband the standing army and switch to having a militia. And the radical Whigs uh, and the some of the Tories at that time, in opposition to the court Whigs, uh, were in favour of scrapping the standing army and 
reverting to a militia. So this is actually a debate that goes right back to the uh, early years of the modern British state. In the event, everyone knew the King of Spain was about to die and that this would spark off yet another huge war with France. And some on the principle that, well, we've got to be ready to fight the French. We, we kept a standing army. We've had one ever since. But actually, yes, I would indeed favour switching to a Swiss-style military system. Uh, I think for geopolitical reasons, apart from anything else, but also reasons of political uh, order and soundness, I would much rather live in a country where uh, you don't have a permanent military establishment and where it's the acknowledged responsibility of all adults to uh, defend their own rights, but also the independence of the community of which they're a part. As I say, that has geopolitical implications. It would mean that foreign intervention, force projection, would no longer be possible. Uh, And that's uh, just one of quite a few benefits that I think would follow from that. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Steve. For more blogs, podcasts, films and reports, visit our website at iea.org.uk.